Hello everyone, this is DC from the DC Life channel here. Thank you so much for checking this video out. The reason why I call this channel DC Life is because this channel is an outlet for me to share the many passions in my life. As you might have noticed, consumer technology is a huge part of it. And I can't wait to share with you an even bigger passion of mine, music. More to come with that for sure, so stay tuned. In fact, this is a great opportunity to remind you how much your subscription to this channel helps with my continued efforts to share the best content I can bring you. So hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell to stay informed on all things new on DC Life. This video is about my love for all things comic books and entertainment. What a timely season as Wonder Woman 1984 just released worldwide, especially in the United States on Christmas Day, December 25th, at limited theaters and on HBO Max. I've seen it twice, and I've spent some time processing my thoughts on it. So let's dive into my review of Wonder Woman 1984. <laughs> Giganta disclaimer! I love DC Comics, and I'm beyond excited with the DCEU. When I first realized that WB was trying to start a movie universe with Ryan Reynolds' Green Lantern, I was ecstatic. I was a little puzzled as to why Green Lantern is the first choice to start the franchise. Kind of makes sense that it didn't work. How dare you! No disrespect to Mr. Reynolds or Hal Jordan himself, but when they announced that the Man of Steel was the beginnings of this new DCEU and there were actually Easter eggs throughout the movie to show you that other DC characters exist in this universe, the nerd in me just could not contain himself. Now, I will be very forgiving and maybe just a little bit biased in this review. I love Wonder Woman. I want her to continue to have movies. I love Gal Gadot. She is Wonder Woman to me. I love that the Wonder Woman franchise is in the hands of Patty Jenkins because it is very apparent that she loves Wonder Woman herself. Despite this little stumble with Wonder Woman 1984, I want to remind everyone that she gave us the 2017 Wonder Woman movie. And more importantly, I want a Justice League trilogy. So I want everyone to be forgiving with me with this movie. Because at the end of the day, we have the ingredients for a great DCEU. We've got great actors playing these characters. We've got beyond talented experience and beloved creators behind these movies. Now, the MCU has already four Avengers movies and a boatload of successful solo movies. So definitely feel free to express what you don't like with this movie, but offer constructive criticism and do not cancel Wonder Woman 1984 or the DCEU. Be careful what you wish for. After World War I, the immortal Wonder Woman continues her adventures in 1984, living a secluded and lonely life while secretly fighting crime. Diana befriends Barbara Minerva, a sheepish and ignored colleague at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. They stumble upon an ancient wish-granting gemstone that gradually wreaks havoc in the world one wish at a time. Enters Maxwell Lord, a TV personality con man who manipulates Barbara to possess the gemstone for world domination. Steve Trevor returns magically by a wish from Diana through the gemstone and together they embark on a global adventure to stop Maxwell Lord and Barbara, who through the gemstone eventually turns into one of Wonder Woman's most popular villains, the Cheetah. All right, here is the extent of my spoiler-free review of Wonder Woman 1984. This is definitely a step back from the 2017 Wonder Woman movie. It is way more comic book superhero, almost more kid-friendly. The tone is completely different. Almost seems like Patty Jenkins took too big of a bet on everyone's love for all things 80s and Richard Donner's Superman movies. It is too campy for my liking 
and a little too long. Unfortunately, Patty Jenkins' artistic risks have basically wasted many things that the first movie so beautifully achieved. It had so much goodwill for it as a sequel to be a success. But it is absolutely not garbage. It should not be dismissed. You definitely should give it a chance and simply enjoy what could have been a fun blockbuster movie if we were all not facing a pandemic. There you go. Now let's really discuss this movie. So warning, from this point onwards, we're moving into spoiler territory. Patty Jenkins showcases her talent as a filmmaker and that she listened to the criticisms of the first Wonder Woman movie. All actors have moments to shine in this movie. Chris Pine is charming as ever. Kristen Wiig impresses us with her ability to transition from insecure to apex predator. Pedro Pascal flexes his range as an actor from flamboyant conman to over-the-top villain to sensitive and humble loving father. Gal Gadot is one woman. She is great in the action scenes, very graceful and powerful at the same time. She also for the first time proves that she is capable of vulnerable and emotional scenes. Chris Pine may have been narrating the letting go scene at the beginning of the third act, but it was Gal's emotional and broken portrayal of Diana that made it believable. No one is left behind, and it's all thanks to Patty Jenkins. Overall, the film seems more epic, especially in the opening Amazonian games scene. Themyscira never looked more lush, green, and expansive. The Amazons are leaping, flipping, almost flying, lassoing arrows, swinging by towers, and spinning on this seesaw-like contraption. I think I've seen it before on Cirque du Soleil. It's kind of cool. They're using their body weight to kind of just uh, move this contraption. But my question is, what exactly were they doing? Were they just spinning the entire time? I mean, during the entire games, you know? But it's still cool. Like in the first movie, Diana narrates us through the beginning, setting up the major theme for the movie. That same featured Amazon, Vanalia, I think her name was, was right there next to baby Diana. She was the one who lassoed the mother box away from Steppenwolf in Justice League. Hippolyta and Antiope were both there and they were so cool and regal and majestic as they've always been. One key sign of growth with Patty Jenkins as the director is we don't get to hear that silly small talk that Antiope did at the beginning of the first movie. Looks very good, very good. How is she? She's good. Keep working. I will. If I were to grade this scene from 1 to 10, it is a 20. This scene sets me up to get excited about this movie and it reminded me of the first movie and how much I loved it and make me feel like this one is going to continue that and move it to the next level because it has a bigger budget and Petty Jenkins is in complete control. Then we move into the present time in the movie, the 80s. We get to see everything from a Walkman to leggings, big hair, bright colors, an arcade, and of course a mall. We get to see Wonder Woman saving the day, incognito by taking out cameras and telling the little girl to keep it a secret. It's all very 80s, I mean, down to the wink between Wonder Woman and the little girl she saves. All that's left is a thumbs up and a big smile. Right here is when we realize that this movie has a completely different tone from the first movie. No more war scenes, no more monotone color schemes. This movie is bright and unapologetically colorful. Also, no more first movies successfully balancing superhero with groundedness reality. That's when anxiety kicks in. But this Christmas season, Wonder Woman 1984 brings us the gift of flight. Personally, I don't really know why this movie is set in 1984. Maybe there's a reason. I mean, Patty Jenkins is being very specific. It's not 1980s. 
it's 1984. Immediately, you think of George Orwell's book, but then there's really no Big Brother vibe in this movie. I've looked up 1984 movies and Ghostbusters came up. Kristen Wiig connection, maybe? Indiana Jones came up too. It would have been great if there was some kind of a searching for an artifact or treasure journey, going through booby trap fortresses. I suppose the second act had a little bit of that traveling to Egypt, car chase in the desert scene, but not to the extent of needing to name the movie 1984. If anything, it's distracting. I'm taken out of the movie several times because of seemingly intentional choices of camera shots and special effects to make this look like an 80s movie. I understand this needs to take place before BVS, but again, why 1984? I just don't get it. Comment down below if you think you know why this movie is set in 1984. There is a duality in the character of Wonder Woman. She is an Amazon warrior, yet an ambassador of peace and love and compassion. That makes her interesting and opens up all sorts of possibilities and not a stumbling block to amazing storytelling. Personally, I think in order for this movie to be more universally appealing, we need more action. I'm glad Diana learned since the first movie that she doesn't need to always deliver a fatal blow to save the day, but it would be nice to see her let loose a little bit. I have no problems with Diana struggling with getting over Steve and being sad and reclusive after losing her friends since World War I. In fact, it's consistent and beautiful storytelling. This is masterfully depicted by simply showing pictures that she has throughout her apartment. It adds a humanity to Wonder Woman that even comic book writers struggle to show. She is not a robot. Actually, I would have a problem with her just simply being all happy and moved on. I am completely comfortable with the concept of being in love with someone for life. On top of that, Diana is immortal. She has never experienced people dying around her till the Germans arrived in the 2017 Wonder Woman movie. It absolutely makes sense to me that she would struggle with letting go of her first love and her only family since her arrival on Man's World. She's already sacrificed her Amazonian family to save mankind, so it would make complete sense to me that Diana is depressed and hesitant to open up again. 70 years is nothing to an immortal. It's just sad to me that this is lost because the movie is too convoluted. What's beautiful here, it's so faithful to who Wonder Woman is that despite her sadness and grief, she continues to save others and make a difference. It would make sense to her to want to stay out of the limelight and only reveal herself when she meets other superhuman beings like herself in BVS and Justice League. Another beautiful moment is that she chose to open up to Barbara out of compassion. She wasn't doing it for herself. She was doing it out of love for a broken Barbara. I think I solved this whole Zack Snyder Wonder Woman staying out of man's will element of the story. Patty and Zack, you can totally use this. Just hook me up with some behind the scenes of the DCEU. Wonder Woman can fly, or at least she's gliding in the wind, like the 70s comics. Wonder Woman has flown since her George Perez run in the 80s. I have no problems with this not being consistent with Snyder's BVS and the Justice League. Those movies weren't perfect. And as a fan, I can overlook some inconsistencies so that Wonder Woman can progress in future stories. There is a nod to the invisible jet. I think Patty Jenkins and the writers were just having fun with this. I know that Wonder Woman doesn't really need an invisible jet, especially now that she can fly. I mean, what's up with the demigod? who can fly and is from an ancient race of Amazons with no technology, do it with an invisible jet. 
She was created by the gods and empowered by the gods and now is a demigod and a daughter of Zeus. If Superman can fly, Wonder Woman should be able to fly. And there's no need to explain why. Like I said again, this is just a nod to the invisible jet. Just like her coffee cup, she'll lose this jet and not be able to find it. And there'll be no more invisible jet or her power to make things invisible. Next. The lasso of truth and its power to show the people of the world the truth is actually faithful to the source material. In issue six of George Peraza's run, Diana uses the lasso of truth to defeat Ares by showing him the possible outcome of his conquest of the world through the wars he started. Come to think of it, Ares in the 2017 Wonder Woman movie used this power of the lasso to manipulate Diana to join him. This was actually set up in the first Wonder Woman movie. In Wonder Woman 1984, Maxwell Lord, seeing his past and possible future outcome, especially the fate of his son, could have inspired him to renounce his wish, as it's shown in the movie that he really does love his son. I can't say that could be true for the rest of the world, but one of Wonder Woman's main characteristic is to inspire us to do better. Be sure to share with me what you liked in the Wonder Woman 1984 movie down in the comment section below. The design of the golden armor was awesome, but the execution and the reasoning for the need of the armor is lacking. I actually don't really like Asteria's story of holding back the armies of men by simply just sitting there and taking a beating. I know they really needed to hide Linda Carter's identity. And by the way, the after credits scene revealing Linda Carter as Hysteria is quite awesome. But they could have just not shown her face while she was actually fighting the army of men to help the Amazons escape to Themyscira. In the comic books, Hippolyta and the Amazons actually defeated the army of men before they retreated to Themyscira. Also, how did she know that she needed the armor to fight Barbara? Diana actually did not know Barbara had changed into the cheetah. She actually said she was surprised by it. How did she know she would have needed the armor to protect her from the cheetah's attacks? Besides, she literally just let cheetah mangle the armor's wings and then just shrugged it off to fight the cheetah instead. I really didn't like the showdown in the third act. What was up with that whole dangling in the electric towers with her lasso? There was absolutely no logical strategy with that. I mean, all those years of Amazonian training led to that decision? While I'm at it, why in the world did Barbara turn into the chief? She only said she wanted to be an apex predator. I mean, she could have turned into a Tyrannosaurus, a shark, or a wasp. Oh no, he didn't. Why a cheetah? Is it because of Diana's heels at the beginning of the movie? The wow. cheetah and her awesome backstory was totally abandoned for no reason. At the end of the day, there is nothing wrong with a wish-granting gemstone slash monkey's pod theme. After all, this is a superhero movie. It's fantasy. The entire Avengers MCU franchise was based on magical gemstones destroying our reality. It's all in the execution. Patty Jenkins and the writers seem to have worked really hard at creating rules and a world for this gemstone but also seemed like they got lost in the weeds, getting entangled in the details, balancing the main theme and fan service along with everything else. Thus giving us too much to process and coming off sometimes contradicting the very rules that they've created. It's almost as if in order for Diana to have this big emotional speech at the end of the third act to empower everybody to choose the right thing, to not take shortcuts in life, and to choose truth that everything else was forced to take second place. The message became more important than Wonder Woman herself. Steve Trevor was brought back to life 
then killed off again for this message. Barbara Minerva's awesome backstory and how she became the cheetah were sacrificed to accommodate the wishing powers and this be careful what you wish for theme. Wonder Woman, despite regaining her full powers in the third act, had to be overwhelmed by strong winds that came out of nowhere, supposedly from the wishes of the people around the world, that she had to sit down and talk to everyone instead to win the day. This goes on and on for the entire movie. This very noble, ambitious, and very appropriate theme for a Wonder Woman story was unfortunately a misfire for Patty Jenkins and her already impressive achievement of establishing the 2017 Wonder Woman as the best female superhero, if not one of the best superhero movies ever. I think I really need to stop nerding out. Be like Wonder Woman despite the shortcomings of Wonder Woman 1984 to keep showing love for HBO Max, Patty Jenkins, Gal Gadot, and everyone involved with Wonder Woman and the DCEU so we can have Justice League 2 and 3 and beyond. Life is definitely too short to be hating, overly critical and all negative. Also, show me some Wonder Woman love by clicking on the like, subscribe buttons, and the notification bell, and share this video with all comic book loving moviegoers. Tell me what you think of the movie. Comment down below with all your thoughts of this review and how much you love Wonder Woman and the DCEU. Be sure to also check out DCLife.com for more content from me. Here's to a better DCEU and even better 2021. Remember, life's too short, live it fully. And while I'm at it, why in the world did Barbara turn into the cheetah? She only said she wanted to turn, and she could have turned into a Tyrannosaurus, a Tyrannosaurus, a Tyrannosaurus, turn into a Tyrannosaurus. Hey everyone, this is DC from the DC Life channel. Thank you so much. The Amazons are leaping and uh, uh, leaping. The Amazon same blonde featured Amazon Vanalia was there right next to baby Jesus. Baby Jesus.